So one of the last things we need to talk about is how we go from sample to population, right? We spent a lot of time talking about how to get a good sample, how to make statistics from samples, but how do we actually use this to make a generalization? Well, so here's our data set of 25 apples, their weights, and we're going to assume that this is an accurate representation of the data, so it's an unbiased, right? It's an unbiased sample. And because we're going to assume that this is an accurate representation of the data, well, this is kind of where statistics starts to get a little, a little gray area, a little bit weird. Um, but we're going to assume that because this is an unbiased sample, then our sample mean, right, which is x bar, is what we call an unbiased estim oops, unbiased estimator. for the population mean, right, which is mu. So my big conclusion here, the important thing, is that x bar is basically equal to mu. If we were to have some sort of wacky outlier, you know, you could still use this as an unbiased estimator, but it's a little bit rockier. Things get a little trickier when we talk about standard deviation. The population, if you remember the formula from above, the population standard deviation involves division by the number of elements of the data set, right? Our original formula was this. Right? We had the sum of all our data sets minus data points minus the mean divided by the number of elements, right? Here is this. Well, to estimate the population standard deviation, we're going to divide by n minus 1 instead. And so I'm actually going to change this, whoa, that's not the eraser, to n minus 1. And you might be wondering why, right? I'm, if I'm considering fewer elements, but my population has more elements, why am I doing this? Our goal is to get an unbiased estimate. And because we don't know how accurately this extends to the whole, our sample extends to the whole population, we want to give ourselves some wiggle room, right? We want to give ourselves some room just to say, well, you know, just to be safe, Let's actually call this a smaller, an even smaller sample than what I'm dealing with. This gives me a bigger standard deviation just to make sure there aren't any larger extreme values that are pulling my standard deviation one way or another. So now that I've kind of rambled, let me actually write some of this down. Dividing by n minus 1 gives us a higher standard deviation. And this gives us some wiggle room so to speak, just to say um, that we want to make sure and we want to account for any extreme elements or any possible outliers in the population not present in the sample. Fortunately, we could still do all of this on our calculator. Because on the TI-84, if you remember from our last video where I had the one of our stats up, we had two standard deviations. We had an SX and a sigma X. On our TI-84s, SX is the estimated population standard deviation. I'm just going to abbreviate here to save some time. This is the calculation that's being done with the n minus 1. So this is the calculation that we're talking about here. Our sigma x is our normal standard deviation, our normal standard deviation. It is effectively our sample. It's the sam Well, I don't want to use the word sample because we've used s for sample but it's our sample standard deviation in the sense, actually the same color, in the sense that it's the standard deviation 
of exactly the data entered into the calculator. It kind of assumes that everything I've entered in is actually the population. Um, so that's the standard deviation of just what I've entered into the calculator. So take the word sample here with a grain of salt. Um, it's not exactly what you're thinking. So let's consider a, an example. A machine produces 1,000 marbles each day with a mean diameter of one centimeter. A sample of eight marbles was taken from the production line. Diameters were measured. The results are as follows. What's a likely estimate of the standard deviation for the entire day? So the fact that we're talking about an estimate for the standard deviation, this is where we're talking about this n minus one business because the entire day's production is going to be the population. Right? We're not talking about just the standard deviation of what comes off the line. We're talking about the standard deviation of everything that we've done today. How can I estimate this based on just my sample that came off the line? Well, we're just going to do this um, the way that we've kind of learned how to do it on our GDC, right? This problem, actually, I took it from the book, was designed to be done by hand, which is why they give you the mean. But we don't need that, fortunately. Um, we can actually just do this on our GDC, and that's going to be fine. So here is my data that I've already entered in just to save ourselves some time. And as before, I'm going to go to one bar stats, head down to calculate. And it's right there, right? That's already there for us. We don't have to do any of the crazy calculation by hand. Here it is. Um, so again, SX is our estimated standard deviation for the population. This sigma x is the standard deviation of just the information that we entered into the calculator. So what I'm really looking for is my sx right here. So my for the whole population, we're going to say 0.198. The reason this is higher, again, is to say, well, how do I know if I've only pulled eight marbles, how do I know that like the 10th marble who come off the line isn't an outlier and would have dragged um, the standard deviation Higher. How do I know that I didn't get something that was super large? How, did, how do I know I didn't get something that was too small? It's just to account for the fact that there might be values that would push this standard deviation a little bit wider um, than what I'm just getting from my sample. So I want to be cautious just to be safe. So the last piece that we need to work on here is cumulative frequency. And cumulative frequency just gives us a running total of what's going on. Um, so I'll come to this graph in a second. But what I want to start by saying with cumulative frequency is that with raw data, it's really easy to find the median. Right? If I go to even my sample from up here, it's really easy just to order these and find the middle value. Um, sometimes, though, if the data is graphed or I have interval classes, it's a lot harder to determine the median is or any of the quartiles with any sort of precision. So this is where a cumulative frequency graph can be helpful. And a cumulative frequency graph, as I said, is just going to show the running total of my sample. So in this example here, the free, uh, cumulative frequency graph below shows the weight in grams of 80 peaches picked from a particular peach tree. Now the goal with the cumulative frequency graph is at this point, accounts for all of, in this case, the peaches. This is my Q4, so to speak. Right, and the way we're going to read this on a cumulative frequency graph is to say that any point I have, so for example, this point right here, says that Y number of peaches, if I were to kind of draw out some lines where this point lies, you know, Y peaches weigh x grams or less because I've counted up all of the peaches that's come before. right? So this point here I've marked is 11050 um, and that's to say then that 50 peaches weigh 110 grams or less. That's the way we're going to read this. So I want to estimate the median weight of the peaches so I leave that there, and the 40th percentile of the peaches and then the number of peaches that weigh more than 100 grams. 
So the median weight of the peaches, if we remember, well, how many or what percentage of peaches would be the median? Well, it's 50% of the data. And because this cumulative frequency graph shows raw data, right, it shows just the number of peaches, not a percentage of peaches, then I need to know what 50% of 80 is. Well, 50% of 80 is 40. So I want to know at what point do 40 peach, or what's the weight um, or less that 40 peaches are? That's a really awkward way to say that sentence. Um, what's the weight that 40 peaches lies at on the graph is really what I'm saying. So I'm going to take this 40 and map it along until I hit the graph here. Follow that down. And we can eyeball it and say about 105 uh, grams, I think. That's the 40th percentile. Sorry, the 50th percentile or the median. So that's to say that 50% of the peaches weigh 105 grams or less. It's no different than if um, you've been to the doctor and they've talked about your percentile um, of height or weight. Right, if you're in the 75th percentile of height, that means that 75% of the data is below you. Do the same thing with 40%, right? It's the 40th percentile. So 40% of 80 is 32. So what is kind of the maximum weight of the 32 peaches? So here's about 32. roughly right here I kind of estimate it to be maybe like 97 ish sorry let's just say 40th percentile not 40 percent percentile so again this is to say that 40 percent of the peaches weigh 97 grams or less. Estimate the number of peaches that weigh more than 100 grams. So here's my final piece here. Maybe I'll just actually use, do this up in the box so I have some room to show the whole graph. So more than 100 grams. So let me actually erase all my work here so far. Okay. 100 grams or more. So here is 100 grams. That's not it. Here is 100 grams. How many peaches weigh more than 100 grams? Well, the number of peaches that weighs 100 grams is maybe a little more than 32 because we said that 40% was 32, but 50% was 105. All right, so 32 peaches weigh 97 or less, 40 weigh 105 or less. But I'm pretty close to 30 here, so maybe we'll call it like 35 peaches. But i got to be careful, right? This 35 says that 35 peaches are less than 100 or equal to. So how many are more? That's 80 minus 35, right? That's just arithmetic, so 45 peaches weigh more than 100 grams. That's all we're doing here. It's a lot of just reading and interpreting a graph, but you have to know what the cumulative frequency means also to be successful here. Sometimes these curves are called ogives. Um, and sometimes you'll see percentages instead of actually raw numbers. So in order to make a cumulative frequency graph, let's look at our example back up here. Right? We notice that the cumulative frequency is on the y-axis right here, and our data or our um, measurement is along the x-axis. The initial point, if I have interval classes, it's the lowest um, bound of the lower inter the lower bound of the lowest interval class. If I have raw data, it's just the lowest 
data that I have. Um, each cumulative frequency figure is plotted using the upper bound every time. Right? So if my class went from like 20 to 34, I'm going to have 34 all on my x-axis and then whatever the measurement is on y, um, the frequency, right? Connect all points with a smooth curve just as you've seen above, so let's try one. The heights of a group of college students are listed below. Construct a cumulative frequency graph. Where is the 40th percentile? So let's do my cumulative frequency here. 13, and I'm keeping here just a running total of students, right? So 13 plus 33 is 46. 46 and 35 is 81, 81 and 11 is 92. So I'm just adding column or row by row. That's, that's it. <laughs> that's all there is. I'm gonna zoom out a little so we can see everything. Um, and again, my lowest point x0, my x-intercept is the lower bound of the lowest interval class. So I'm gonna start this graph at 150, zero, right? That's to say that none of the data falls below 150. And then I'm gonna use my upper bounds of each data class for the rest of my points. So 160, 13, right? My point is gonna be 160, 13. So about here, I'm gonna have 170, 46. About there, I'm gonna have uh, 180, 81, and then I'm going to have 190, 92, so about here. And then we're going to try to connect these points with a smooth curve, so kind of like this, and then I'm going to kind of turn this way. I should have hit it, but I'm not going to go back and fix it. Um, and this is going to stop right here. And that's all I'm doing for my cumulative frequency graph. Plot the points, connect them with a the smooth curve. The rest of this problem asked for um, the 40th percentile. So 40% of my number of students is, well, 36.8. Um, which is not a nice round number of students, but we can work off of it and eyeball it. So 35, 36.8 is probably here-ish. So if I trace this downwards, I'm going to get maybe 167.5. So the 40th percentile is approximately 167.5 centimeters, and that's to say that 40% of the students are that or shorter. So that's all I'm gonna do with that cumulative frequency graph. Reading graphs, mapping them back, um, either from Y to X or X to Y.